So uh, we are very happy to have Professor Suveer Sajdev, uh, who is the chair of Department of Physics, Harvard University. And uh, uh, I don't need to introduce Subir because he's quite a famous person. Uh, you can actually uh, go through his profile. He got a lot of recognition honor and uh, I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, today he's, uh, I'm, uh, we are very happy to have him to give a talk in this QAS seminar series. So he's going to talk about linear in temperature resistivity in the limit of zero temperature from the time reparameterization soft mode. And this is his recent paper. And he's going to speak up about this, his recent paper. So please, Shubhi, uh, you can start right now. Excuse me. Well, okay, thank you, Zaitan. Uh, thanks for organizing this uh, seminar. Uh, I must say, I don't have a full sense of who the audience is. Uh, I imagine there are people from high energy physics and maybe uh, also uh, from condensed can, matter. Can you go uh, in the, the full screen mode of your talk? Because your, uh, yeah, right now it is okay. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me all right also? Yeah, 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 it's okay. Okay, right. So I was saying, I, I, I don't know the, the makeup of the audience. I suspect the people from many different fields of physics. Uh, uh, so, but, uh, you know, please don't hesitate to slow me down. I'm happy to, to say more uh, and explain uh, the basics. And apologies for the, for the long title, <laughs> but uh, it encapsulates, you know, what I think is uh, new about our recent work. So I should begin by uh, acknowledging some of my collaborators. Uh, so I, so this work uh, relies on a previous work uh, which was just published, uh, which I will also have to introduce to to get to get to the main point of the more recent work. Uh, and these are some of the collaborators on that work. Uh, Darshan Joshi, who's a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, Grisha Tanapolsky, also postdoc at Harvard. Chen Yuan Li is a graduate student at Harvard, and Antoine George, uh, well-known person uh, who was involved in the development of dynamical mean field theory. Uh, the more recent work is uh, with the postdoc Ying Fei Gu and uh, one of my students, uh, Hai Yu Guo, uh, which I will get to really only towards the end of the end of the talk. Okay, so the essential problem that we are addressing is a very much a central problem in condensed matter, I would say, uh, which and has been the focus of uh, much experimental study over the years. Uh, and I don't think we have a full explanation of this, but I am I am hoping that the ideas we're presenting will be some part of the final answer. So this is sometimes called the strange metal problem, um, and the strange metal is is a, well <clears throat> is a metal whose uh, in particular whose resistivity has a very unusual temperature dependence. Uh, if you take an ordinary metal, it's described by what's called Fermi liquid theory. Uh, and what this means is that at very low temperatures, you get some residual resistivity, uh, comes from the impurities. Uh, and then as you heat, heat the metal up at low temperatures, the resistance increases as the power of T squared. Uh, you know, this is universally observed and the T squared uh, comes from the electron electron interactions. But there's a wide class of materials, you know, they, including the high temperature superconductors and magic angle graphene, and, nictides and even ultra cold atoms uh, where you find a wide regime of temperatures where this is not true. So these are systems that are metals. Uh, let's define metal as something that has a reasonably large conductivity which and where the resistance increases as you increase the temperature. Um, and in these metals, the resistance uh, increases only linearly with temperature. Uh, so if you were to write uh, the resistance in terms of what's called the Duda formula, uh, which is a standard Boltzmann theory formula for quasi particles in a metal, uh, you can convert the resistance to a time, which would be the Duda time, the scattering time of the electrons. Uh, and a typical metal that due to time or the Duda rate would increase quadratically with temperature. But what you find in strange metal is that it increases linearly with temperature. Now should add 
it's quite easy to get a linear temperature dependence at high temperature, say from electron phonon scattering, but it's very hard to get that at low temperatures. Uh, and that's what's remarkable about some of these more recent measurements is that this is observed down to very low temperatures, uh, lower than any natural scale. Also another feature which hints at some kind of universality is that if you look at the, so it's linear in temperature, but if you look at the prefactor here in these units, uh, it's typically about a one. So really there's no energy scale that appears other than temperature and, this, uh, and in many different compounds, which have very different Fermi energies and uh, strengths of interactions, uh, you get the same scattering rate as interpreted by using the Drudo formula, which, which you really shouldn't, of course, because you don't have uh, the preconditions for applying the Drudo formula in these materials. So Subir, what is so the just, star here? Sorry? The M star, is it effective mass or something like that? Oh yes, thank you. So M star would be some effective mass of the electronic excitations. So in the, <clears throat> and N is the density of electrons. So in the experiments, and I was just going to show you some data. Uh, so here's some uh, measurements in a variety of high temperature superconductors and an organic superconductor. Uh, so they know the density from various measurements. They also can measure M star, again, by measuring the specific heat or cyclotron resonance or quantum oscillations or some such. So they have some estimates, pretty good estimate of what M star should be. And then from N and M star, they can then deduce uh, the glutus scattering time and then from that, the number alpha. And what you see here is across you know, a wide range of systems, um, alpha is pretty close to one. Okay, so that, suggest that you know there's some kind of universal explanation independent of what particular material you're looking at and hopefully even independent of many microscopic details uh, and and that's really what we will be searching for uh, more limited you know you can say the aim of theory should be which has really been a challenge is to find a model i don't care what model uh, no matter how artificial but you know maybe not too artificial uh, in which the temperature derivative of the resistivity as temperature goes to zero is a number. Okay, uh, in, in a Fermi liquid, this would go as T linearly in T on the right hand side, so it would vanish. So it should be a number that's not equal to zero. Is there any model? And really, as far as I know, up to now, there is no model which obeys this, uh, this constraint. Okay, so I'm going to present a model uh it's of course it's a slightly artificial model as uh, but uh, uh and hopefully it can be generalized to be more realistic but uh we think that's an important starting point to at least get a model of it this is true okay all right so that's the introduction so let me now uh give you the outline of the topics i'm going to discuss so there's several different things that are going to come together uh, in our final models, or it looks kind of complicated, but in the end, I, I hope I'll convince you it's all uh, rather natural. Uh, and But there's two basic ingredients uh, that we need, uh, which we've sort of understood only in, in recent years. Uh, and once you put them together, uh, you immediately get uh, the observed behavior. So the two ingredients are here in red. One is uh, the time reparameterization soft mode. So what is that? Well, I'm going to explain that in a minute. Uh, and where this first appeared was in the study of what's called the SYK model, uh, which is a solvable model of strongly interacting electrons. Um, and, however, we expect this time reparameterization mode to be a much more general thing, be present in many other models uh, of a similar type, or maybe not that similar, but, and those are the models that are typically very hard to solve. Uh, but there's this basic ingredient uh, of this time in transition soft mode, which leads to what I will call SYK criticality. And I'll, I will describe what I mean by that in, in a few minutes. Now, since this is a talk at a gravitational institute, I will just mention very briefly, uh, there's another system that has a time reparameterization soft mode. And that's just uh, charged black holes in Einstein's theory. Uh, and uh, curiously, you know, this soft mode was never discovered before, even though it's just Einstein's theory. 
uh, until after the recent work on the time on the SYK model. Uh, okay, so then I'll come back to discussion of uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, the SYK model is kind of a zero dimensional model, which just lives, doesn't have any sense of space. Uh, then uh, there have been many attempts to extend SYK models to, uh, to a lattice by taking a lattice of these models. Uh, and those have, you know, give behavior that's sort of strange metal-like, it's very encouraging, but ultimately it doesn't work down to low temperatures. So this really doesn't solve the, the hard part of the problem, I would say. Then I'll turn to the more recent work uh, where the second idea that uh, I will describe, and the second idea that we need is fractionalization. Uh, this is an emergent gauge field. So this is missing in the SYK model, and when you have to put it back in, I'll show you how we put it back in. And once you do that, you get what you need. All right, so that's kind of where we're going to go. Uh, so many different topics, uh, but hopefully uh, you'll see how it all fits together. So let me just describe the SYK model. Um, so uh, it's a very simple to define uh, after the fact. Uh, so imagine you have a bunch of sites or orbitals. This each circle represents a state, a quantum state that an electron can occupy, uh, and you occupy some fraction of them. And now you have a Hamiltonian that's going to act on these many particles, so many particle state. Uh, and there's just a simple constraint uh, that you're going to move fermions. Here I'm ignoring the spin uh, from from one side to the other, but you're always going to move them in pairs. So for example. Uh, these two these two fermions here can move as shown, uh, but they only move together. So basically when they do that, they're essentially entangled with each other. Uh, and so this is another possibility. And, uh, and the bottom line is anything that's allowed will happen with a certain amplitude. Um, and what is that amplitude? Well, the amplitude is a random number. So you just pick a random number uh, for convenience with zero mean, uh, and that's it. So it turns out that uh, remarkably, so even though you're picking so many random numbers, uh, what numbers you pick doesn't matter other than their mean, mean square value uh, because of self-averaging. And the reason there's such a remarkable amount of self-averaging here uh, is because there's, uh, you know, you have n sites, there's two to the n states. There's a large number of states, exponentially large states, and that leads to very rapid self-averaging, uh, at least in some phases of the model. So here's the, the model written out uh, more explicitly. Uh, a, B, C, D are these labels of these orbitals or sites or whatever you want to call them. Uh, C is the electron operator. Uh, there's a chemical potential here, uh, which uh, controls the density of the average density of the electrons, and this density operator commutes to the Hamiltonian. I should say, uh, certainly in the particle theory literature, people deal with Majorana fermions, uh, which I will not, I need them to be actual electrons, not Majorana fermions. And in the case of Majorana fermion, there is no density that commutes uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Hamiltonian. Uh, so this has, you know, makes some difference, but uh, essentially the properties are the same, whether you take Majorana fermions. Uh, yes, or, I have a question. So yes. this uh, mu term, is it chemical potential which you have added additionally with? Yeah, that's a chemical potential. Yeah. You don't, it commutes with the first term. So uh -huh. you, you, you don't need, really need to add it, add it but it, it's one way of work. If you're working in a grand canonical ensemble, you have it. If you're okay. working in a canonical ensemble, you don't need it. Okay. And uh, what this uh, u u is kind of a strength, but what what this comma corresponds to the semicolon? Um, that's because uh, well, the a b refer to the first two indices, the c d just to reminding you that these two uh, refers to annihilation operators, and the other two refer to can. So there's no symmetry between uh, a b and c d being interchanged, but there's a sim anti symmetry with a. If you need to interchange a and b. Uh, that must be anti-symmetric. If you interchange C and D, it must be anti-symmetric. You cannot interchange A, B, and C, D because this thing does not have that symmetry. Okay. Now, when you have Majorana fermion, there are all from there, there's no annihilation and creation operators, and then you don't need the semicolon. That's all. 
it, it makes the counting a little bit different. The fact that the fact is a fact of two year would be slightly different if you use Majorana fermions. Okay. Okay. All right, so these are random numbers uh, with zero mean and some mean square value u. Uh, but as I said earlier, the model is self-averaging, so you only need one set of numbers. Uh, and once you had one set of numbers, if n is large enough, uh, every site would look the same, it would be independent of this. Every site would be the same. It would have the full permutation, you know, full symmetry. Uh, uh, forget about symmetry. Every site would look the same. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's the model. Uh, and it turns out to be relatively easy to solve with a large n limit. One simplest way to do it in the end is just do a Feynman graph expansion and you average it over. Uh, then this is the Dyson equation for the Green's function, only depends on frequency. And the self energy uh, is just the cube of the Green's function. So these are the two equations that you have to solve. Uh, which looks simple enough, but uh, even today, we don't understand everything about the solution of these two equations. Uh, in terms of diagram, this corresponds to this expression for the self-energy and leads to what are called the Mellon diagrams if you draw them all out uh, term by term. <clears throat> so it's a resum of all the Mellon diagrams. So now I'm just going to characterize what we learned from the solution of these three equations. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that those pro the properties I'm going to describe are those that generalize to many other models, which are much harder to solve. Uh, okay. But it's always, you know, but many of them were discovered while solving this model. So that shows the value of having something that you can solve completely. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so is it, is it correct to say that this is basically a four fermion interaction? Correct. Right. Okay. So it's a four fermion interaction with random coupling. Random four fermion, all to all random four fermion. All to all. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, I'm going to make I it think. more realistic as we go along. But right now, <laughs> it's this model, you'd have to work really hard in the experiments to make such a system, and people are trying. Uh, but, but this is, I mean, there's also some recent work where you can uh reduce the all to all requirement you can make it much more sparse and you still preserve the properties but let's just discuss the the simpler model for now uh, excuse me Subir, uh, what what tau stands for tau is imaginary time um well in the in the upper line we see that g the green function is a function of frequency but in the lower line it's a function of imaginary time so so could you please comment this yeah, they're just related by a Fourier transform. So yeah, I use the same symbol for G of oh, I see, I see. G of tau. Oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. I, I assume you've done the Fourier transform. Clear, thank so you. So that's why if you combine these equations into some equation for, <clears throat> for G of omega, for example, that's a complicated integral differential equation. It's not easy to solve. Subir, maybe an aside, uh, you mentioned that there are some recent work that uh, relaxes this uh, uh, requirement on the yeah. randomness of the coupling. Yeah, uh, right. Could you quickly point to me what, what that work is? Uh, the one I know about, I don't know if it's uh, actually out yet. It's maybe, I, I just heard about it personally from uh, Brian Swingle, but I, I heard him give a talk about it. I think I it should be out soon. <laughs> okay, I look forward to it. Yeah. But I'm going to also relax it by the end of this talk. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what are the, you know, what I call, what I, what I want to do next is, is describe what I call the key properties of SYK criticality. So these are all properties obeyed by the SYK model, but I'm going to emphasize those that I think are more general. Okay. First of all, uh, it's a critical gapless state, meaning as power law correlations of lots of things. Uh, for a range of, with some anomalous power laws for a range of densities around Q equals one half. Uh, so let me just quickly show you how you get that. Well, you just make, you go back to these equations here, you make an ansatz for sigma of tau and G of tau, and you just look for their solution at low energies, which is what we did in 93, uh, and you get a solution for of this type. 
It takes a while for this screen to update. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, I should keep track of both screens. <laughs> All right, so here's the amplitude for the propagation of a particle from at a given site from time zero to time tau. Uh, and that falls off as one over square root of tau. Uh, and there's a similar amplitude for a hole to propagate and that falls off with the same one over square root of tau, but the amplitude is a bit different. Uh, this should be contrasted with what happens in a Fermi liquid. If you have any disordered Fermi liquid or even a non-disordered Fermi liquid, if you look for the local at a given point in space uh, propagator, it falls off as one over tau. Uh, so that's immediately an indication that this is not a system that has electron-like quasi-particle excitations. It could have some other excitations, which are quasi-particles, but we know it doesn't. But uh, um, but for that, you need more complicated computations. Okay, uh, there's also some difference between the uh, particle propagation, the whole propagation having to do with the charge density Q and particle only symmetry. Uh, that I won't need that for the main part of my talk, so I won't say more about that. All right, so that's property number one. Uh, that's the quantum critical state. Okay, so property number two, which initially seems uh, rather disturbing, uh, is that if you take this limit, if you compute the entropy of the model at any temperature in any n, and you take this limit where you send n to infinity first and then temperature to zero, uh, this is not zero. Now, in most systems with quasi-particle excitation, in fact, if you have quasi-particle excitations, this is always zero. Uh, and sometimes that's called the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, so this seems to be a violation of a third law of thermodynamics that you've got so much entropy down to zero temperature. Uh, and, uh, you know, initially it, it did bother us, but now since uh, the new form of the SYK model, you can study it numerically. Uh, and this model with random interaction does indeed have this remarkable property that's it's been confirmed. And even the number we computed for this uh, in 2001 uh, agrees with present day numerics. But what makes it a little less disturbing, uh, this, this entropy, one is very careful to think about the order of limits. Uh, what is rather anomalous is if you had an exponentially large degeneracy of states at, at uh, zero temperature. Uh, you know, that requires a huge amount of fine tuning. So if you, there's something called Pauling's ICE model, which has the ICE entropy. It's a purely classical model with some local frustration rules, and that does have uh, a exponentially large ground state degeneracy. But that degeneracy is not robust. You add any other interaction, you immediately lift it. However, this entropy is not due to degeneracy. It's really due to an exponentially small spacing between many body levels, uh, which is not that surprising. You always get exponentially large small spacing in many body level, but this goes down to zero temperature. And furthermore, this entropy is robust. You can do, you can make all kinds of changes to the small changes to the SYK Hamiltonian, and this will not change. So uh, there's only one change that's relevant rather than an infinite number of changes. And that change I will discuss also very shortly. And that change has the effect of reintroducing quasi particles. Okay, so that's property number two. Uh, sorry, so probably them. Yes, please go on. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, my question is which kind of changes uh, uh, you are talking about that leave this? If you add uh, a single particle hopping, if you add single particle hopping, then the entropy is this entropy, this limit vanishes. Then you get a conventional behavior. Thank you. But if you change, add any kind, change the interactions or add a multi body interaction, change anything, uh, this is this is present. Can I ask a question? Um, what what sure. happened? If you change the order of limits, does the answer change for entropy? Uh, sure. I mean, if you, if you take the zero temperature limit first, means you're looking at the ground state. Uh, hmm. And then if you enter infinity, well, then you're asking, is the ground state have an exponential degeneracy? And uh, so for, for the SYK model, the answer would be zero. No, it doesn't. The ground state is actually, it has a two-fold degeneracy or, or is non-degenerate. It does not have any degeneracy. Whereas the ice model, the classical ice model of uh, of uh, Pauling, uh, the opposite order of limits would give you an exponent, would give you a finite answer. 
because the ground state has an exponential degeneracy. So there is no degeneracy of the ground state or any state in fact. <laughs> it's just the states are all close to each other. I see, thank you. Excuse me, also a quick question if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm not that familiar with, with MBL, but as far as I recall for many body localized phase, there's also this vanishing gap above the ground state, maybe even also exponentially small. Would one also expect such a non-zero entropy for ground, ground states of um, MBL systems it's for that same reason? Um, MBL, um, let's see. Um, so you're assuming, I mean, the MBL I thought I had to do with high temperature, but here you're talking about down to the bottom of bottom of the band? Yeah, ex exactly. I'm not exactly. sure, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I mean, uh -huh. typically when you talk about MBL states, you're talking somewhere in the middle of the band. If you go at the very bottom of the band, uh, I don't think uh, you get this behavior there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Why do you have yeah. pairwise hopping? What's the reason for that? Because that's the uh, the, mo the simplest uh, uh, Hamiltonian that give you this behavior. If you have single particle hopping, then then you lose this behavior. But you could have three body, a four body, a five body. It won't make any difference. You get the same same physics. Okay. All right. Um, so another thing you can ask, uh, and this relates to this universal time I talked about earlier, at least uh, in the Rudo formula. But here you ask a little more sophisticated question. You ask, suppose I disturb the system a little bit, how long does it take to equilibrate? Uh, and it turns out this system equilibrates in exactly this Planckian time. So that's one reason we call this Planckian behavior because this is only Planck's constant and temperature that determine the time it takes to equilibrate. And this is not true for any classical system for sure. You know, the, the, the coupling constants and the coupling of the heat path, also all of these things come in in thermal equilibration time, but none of that comes in here. Okay, so now property number four, and this is really the key thing that we're going to use, uh, which is also connected to the three properties I discussed, uh, that it has a time reprogrammization soft mode. Uh, more precisely, it means that there's an effective action with the, which, which has a time reprogrammization symmetry. Uh, which is broken at very low energies down to uh, uh, an SL2R symmetry. Okay, and this will be the key to everything later on. So let me just explain it a little bit more. Where does this come from? Uh, so you remember these equations I wrote down earlier for the SYK model. If you go to very low frequencies, uh, it turns out that you know these terms here just drop out because uh, sigma of omega goes as square root of omega, and that's always bigger than this. And this mu cancels that, and g goes as one over square root of z. And this is, in fact, what we, uh, you know, this is how we solved the problem in '93 by making showing that this approximation was correct. Now, if you drop these two terms, you can rewrite this equation uh, as these two equations here, down here. Uh, so what you see here. So this is just sigma g equals one. That's this equation here. You multiply it out and take a Fourier transform, you get this equation. And this equation is exactly the same. Now I've done very, one very small thing. Instead of writing it as tau one minus tau two, I write it as two different times. Tau one, tau two, tau two, tau three. Uh, okay, so these are the equations now at low energies uh, here. And now these equations, you notice there's no explicit uh, time derivative uh, or uh, frequency or anything. Uh, and so they have a huge symmetry. In particular, they are uh, remain the same form, they retain the form if you reprogram as that, if you take, go from time tau to time sigma. And you also write your Green's function uh, in terms of the Green's function at the time sigma with these, these rescaling factors here. If you just plug all of this in here, you'll find the equations and sigma are exactly the same. Now there's another uh, G here. G is actually a gauge transformation. So it also has an emergent gauge symmetry. This is not present in the Majorana model. Again, that won't be so important for what I talk about. So let me not discuss that here. Okay, so that's the time reparameterization symmetry. Now what is SL2R? Where did SL2R come in? 
Well, so these are the set of equations that you want to solve. And for any solution, at least at low energy, there are a whole infinite set of solutions you can make by you know, reparameterizing time. But in the end, you want solutions that are consistent with the UV physics and which have time translational symmetry. Uh, and those solutions turn out to be the power law solutions I've already mentioned. Uh, so these are the side of actual side of point solution of the full action, tau one minus tau two at zero temperature. And this falls off as three halves power. So now do these solutions, are these solutions time transition invariant? And you can easily check they're not, but they're invariant for a particular f of tau. So f of tau is this, this transformation here. Uh, they're particular for, invariant for a particular f of tau, and that's this transformation where AD minus BC is one. So that's the SL2R group, uh, where A, B, C, D are real numbers. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the symmetry of the ground state. So the time transition symmetry is broken down to SL2R, and there's some effective action for the fluctuations of F of tau, uh, which I will mention in a bit later. Okay, so that is what the time transition symmetry is. All right. Now another property of SYK criticality uh, is that. Here, can is I have a question of a previous slide? Yes. Uh, so this one. You're oh, saying one before uh, that. One before that. Yeah. Right. So um, strictly speaking, this SL2R symmetry is also approximate, right? Because if you introduce the UV uh, effects, then the full Green's function at all time scales <coughs> should also violate this uh, SLR symmetry, is that right? Um, that's correct, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so, but, uh, yeah, it's a long, it's an emergent symmetry that's still present. Uh, I see. Yeah. So there's a hierarchy of broken symmetries. Right, so the in so that term that you're talking about is, uh, is irrelevant uh, in that sense, but, it's dangerous to be relevant, as we'll see, because we have to worry about uh, we have to worry about its effects. I see. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it, it's somewhat similar to you know, suppose you have a critical point uh, where you only have say Z four symmetry, but at the critical point it becomes an X Y symmetry. And then there's there's no real Goldstone mode, but it still kind of becomes very low energy, you know, near the critical point. Right. <coughs> okay. So next. Okay. So that's uh, time reprogramming in soft mode. Uh, the next thing, obviously, is a huge amount of discussion for various other reasons. Something called the out of time order correlator, uh, which uh, characterizes quantum chaos. And in this case, this quantity lambda is 2 pi kt over h bar. Again, this Planckian time, where you even know the prefactor here exactly. Uh, so that's the maximal, uh, there's a bound, I guess, the MSS bound, which uh, this saturates. <coughs> okay, excuse me. Uh -huh. So I won't say anything more about this, won't really need it, but I just mentioned it as one of the features of SYK criticality, uh, because it's also, in the end, connected to this time. It, it, because of the time reprogrammation soft mode, that the OTOC saturates uh, the bound on chaos. Okay, finally, property six, which is actually not as general, which is why I put a dashed line around it. Uh, if, you, if these fermions had an extra label, a spin label or a flavor label, then you can define a spin operator, which is a fermion bilinear. Uh, and in this case, this will decay as one over tau. So that will become important for the, the final discussion of transport uh, in strange metals. All right, so that's just a summary then of the first part of my talk. First part, that's the first part of my talk where I told you what are the five important characteristics of SYK criticality, all of which are ultimately connected to this time in transition soft mode. Okay, now all of those five characteristics. Yes. So there is no feature, new feature of this charge uh, uh, mode in this time reparameterization, right? The same was same as the Majorana uh, system. Uh, same. Uh, uh, I will. Yes and no. So I'm going to answer that in just a minute. Okay. 
So there is a slight difference, but it won't be important for what I'm talking about. Okay. okay. So now let me talk about charged black holes. So uh, this is just for, uh, for, you know, for, for cultural interest, because uh, these five properties that I just mentioned are also properties, strangely enough, uh, of a semi-classical quantization of Einstein's equations. So it's good to, good to see how that happens. So what you do is you take the Einstein Maxwell theory, you know, just exactly the same theory, and you take a negative cosmological constant uh, and you solve it with certain boundary conditions. You have a boundary condition uh, that you have a black hole uh, with a total charge Q. Uh, and so there's a black hole here behind the horizon with a charge Q and that's so there's some electric field going out, uh, out to infinity. Uh, and when you measure by Gauss's law, the, the charge with an electric field out here, you'll still see the charge Q. Okay. Uh, and the negative cosmological constant makes the asymptotic geometry anti of four. Uh, that's not really that essential, but okay, that's, that's the case that we can understand the best. So let's keep that. But a universal feature of any black hole that's charged uh, is that there is a change in the geometry from asymptotically ADS4 here to something that becomes ADS2 cross S2. So what is that? Well, here's the metric written out. This is the ADS2 part. It has two directions, a zeta, which is this direction, which it becomes infinity at this point, uh, and t, which is time. And this is now in the Lorentzian signature. Uh, this is some overall scale parameter. And then the other two form an S2. So this is a black hole with a sphere, and this is the transverse directions of the sphere. Uh, and this is the metric right near the horizon. So what you see then is that at very low, very close to the horizon, the metric factorizes. There's a two-dimensional part, and then there's the angular part of the sphere. And you can just uh, just focus on this part, because all the low energy physics, the low low frequency modes correspond to this. Uh, and there's also um, a gauge there field, so there's a net charge. Yes. Is there a typical length scale in which the ADS4 uh, crosses over to ADS2 cross S2? Uh, yes, yes. So that's basically related to R2 and RH. Yeah. I see. Basically this, yeah. <clears throat> so I have a paper where all those length scales are carefully spelled out because, you know, uh, of course I didn't discover this, but I went through the calculations step by step in great detail and uh, written it down in a paper. Okay, so that's the Neo Horizon geometry. All right, so now. Let's look at some of the properties of this near horizon geometry. First of all, you have this ADS2 metric. Uh, so this metric has certain symmetries, so-called isometries. And the symmetry of this metric right here is exactly SL2R. So that's Quick a question. question. So that, yes. So this is a three plus one dimensional system, right? Correct. Okay, just wanted to. But, but if you look at the, if you semi-classically quantize this in the near horizon region, the low energy part, uh, the transverse, these two dimensional modes become high energy and you can just focus on, on this part. So it becomes a one plus one dimensional system effectively at low energies. Okay, okay so that's, so first of all, there's SL2R, which we saw before. Another thing about these uh, horizons is that at low temperatures, if you use the Hawking expression, Bekenstein Hawking expression for the entropy, uh, again, something that's been known for a long time, uh, it's finite. There's this N S zero right here, uh, and just given by the area of the, uh, of the horizon, which doesn't shrink even at zero temperature. This is a so-called extremal black hole, which every charged black hole reaches at low enough temperatures. Okay, so that's another thing that's similar to the SYK model. And in fact, I wrote a paper a long time ago pointing out these similarities at this point. But the most robust, I mean, the, uh, but the similarity is much stronger, which is only understood more recently by Kitev and Maldasena and uh, Stanford, is that you can actually go beyond the, just the, the Hawking entropy. You can also look at corrections to the Hawking entropy. Uh, 
from fluctuations of the metric. And it turns out that the leading corrections come from this boundary. There's some boundary where the geometry goes from two dimensions to four dimensions. Here is ADS4, it's ADS2 cross S2. There's some uh, boundary layer where it goes from one to the other. Uh, and then by very clever uh, rewriting of the, of the degrees of freedom in this region, you can reduce everything to the shape of this boundary. And you write down some effective action for the shape of the boundary. And that effective action has exactly the property that I discussed. It has a time parameterization symmetry, and which is broken down to S of 2R by the background metric. Here, of course, the time parameterization symmetry is not, not such a surprise. It's just, you know, it's a feature of Einstein's equations of that space-time reparameterization symmetry. Uh, but uh, in this background metric, there's still some residual fluctuations that come from the boundary fluctuation. All right, so that's really uh, what I want to say about the gravitational connection. I won't really use this. What I will use is the time reparameterization mode. Uh, okay, here's a bunch of references of various people who have worked on this gravitational work. Uh, the paper I mentioned with a lot of details, which I wrote from my own review, was, was right here at the bottom. Uh, and now let me actually show you what that action is. So this is the main result. You can start out either with the SYK model uh, at some, uh, and look at very low temperatures, or you can start out with a charged black hole of some radius RH. A temperature is much, much smaller than RH. And both of these systems, and you can start either with the quantum model or you can start with Einstein's equations. Uh, and what you will get is an effective action, uh, which is written down here. So it has two pieces. Uh, one is this Schwarzschild. So this is the, this is the Schwarzschild is some functional of F of tau, uh, which uh, has this SL2R, in, which doesn't change under SL2R transformations. Uh, it has a coefficient which we write as alpha s over j. This is just some combination convenient for condensed matter applications. What is that coefficient? Well, that coefficient determines the linear and temperature correction to the entropy. So that I've already talked about the zero temperature entropy. This is the linear and temperature. Condensed matter physics, this is called the gamma value uh, of the specific heat. Okay, so that is present both for the black hole and for the SYK model. Uh, this other part, again, I won't say more about, but this is answering Yashar's question. This is because I'm dealing with a charged black hole or a charged SYK model is another phase mode, uh, sort of like a rotor which couples to the Schwarzschild and, and it's important for certain effects, but not for this talk. Okay. All right, so I'm done with charged black holes then. Uh, and now let me get back to the condensed matter uh, root. Uh, this thing doesn't. Okay. Uh, of SYK lattice model. Any questions on so far? Okay. So one route that many people have taken, uh, and in fact it goes back to ideas of George and Parkale a long time ago, but more recently by Xiu Yang Song and Chaoming Jiang and Liang Balance. Uh, so. The SYK model I talked about so far, you can think of as this quantum dot. There's some island here with, <clears throat> with many states, n states that the electron can occupy. So that's the label A. But then you take a lattice of these islands, which are labeled by I. Uh, so you have some interaction within an island, that's this term here. And then you also have the possibility for an electron to hop from here to there. And that's the T over there. So this, you know, really need this because only when you have some hopping do you have any sense of space. So now you have a lattice, you can take a regular lattice uh, of some type uh, and uh, electrons can now move around and you can talk about things like resistivity. You know, how, how you put an electric field, how will the electron propagate or heat propagate in this lattice? Okay, so this can, this can be worked out by similar methods. It's basically the same set of equations, but uh, uh, now you have a momentum here to worry about, uh, and the equation is a bit more complicated to solve, but they can, the behavior can be understood. And, and what do you find? Well, you find some good things uh, and some not so good things. So what you find is, first of all, uh, let me talk about the not so good things. 
that there is a <clears throat> temperature below which uh, you lose the SYK criticality that I described, meaning that you lose the, you recover quasi particles, the entropy vanishes, you don't have maximal chaos, all those nice properties disappear at low enough temperatures. Uh, and at some level, that's not surprising. That's because I have this one particle hopping. As I've said earlier, this is a relevant perturbation that lifts everything. So it seems it basically destroys all the nice properties eventually at low enough temperatures. Uh, uh, you just recover a disordered Fermi liquid. However, if you're above this temperature T squared over U, there's a range of temperatures, which could be very large if T is much smaller than U, little t. Well, in fact, you do get linear uh, in T resistance uh, and, uh, and all the other properties of SYK that I talked about earlier, they basically survive. Uh, and so, okay, so you have a strange metal of, uh, of an interesting type, which may well be useful in understanding some materials, but it doesn't really go down to very low temperatures uh, as low as we'd like from our estimate of these parameters uh, in, in many of the recent materials. So it doesn't completely solve the problem we are asked, for, but it, it's, it's a step, I think, in the right direction. Okay. Uh, right, so, so, so the linear anti resistivity is only present at high, intermediate temperatures. And there's not no special role by the electron density. It can happen in any density. Uh, whereas in most materials, this kind of behavior only happens over some range of densities. Um, and okay. uh, in many of the materials also, there's a low so-called pseudo gap phase, which I'll say a bit more about. That's totally absent here if you apply it to the cube rates. And really all of these features I'm going to argue here are traced back to what sometimes called motness. There's no you know, local repulsion between the electrons. I mean, when you, the electrons interact with each other, but there's no, you know, they only see it on average. Every, every little orbital here doesn't, if there's an electron occupied here with spin up, it doesn't prohibit the electron with spin down. So there's no local mod character, which you need to get insulating behavior in these systems. So that's what's totally missing. Okay, so now I've set things up. Yes. Uh, what is the motivation for the island picture? Uh, <laughs> just having something to solve when you have SYK physics. <laughs> it's, just the, it's the simplest perturbation of an SYK model that gives you, gives you a way to compute the conductivity. No, I mean, uh, okay. I, I mean, mean, why don't you I, add... Okay, there's another, another motivation I can give you is uh, when people solve, uh, use DMFT, uh, in multi-orbital systems, like say the nictides where you have 5D orbitals, and you solve the DMFT equations, uh, just just with five orbitals, you find you get a large intermediate regime. There's a work of Philip Werner that uh, and collaborators that's been shown, where you get essentially SYK-like physics, uh, which uh, would then correspond to this type of SYK island model. So it's you know. I would say it's to, it's one of the <coughs> very very few, in fact, lattice model of strongly interacting electrons, which has which is exactly solvable and gives you a non-Fermi liquid over some intermediate temperature regime. Uh, so even though I made it seem like it's disappointing, I mean that's that's quite an achievement. We don't have any other models that exactly solvable which have non-Fermi liquid behavior over any temperature range. So it's okay. it's a step in the right direction for sure. All right. Thanks. Um, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, so in the next slide, you show the, um, it's like a model show the uh, no T linear resistivity in very low temperature, right? Correct. Um, but um, in the real strange material, a uh, strange metal material show even in low temperature, right? Correct. So that's, that's the problem I want to solve. Correct. Uh -huh. so that's okay. why, this is not the final answer. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, so there could be some materials, like I mentioned, you know, multi-orbital materials. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which, uh, this yeah. this could still be relevant. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, yeah, very, yeah, com 
yeah, pass ring problem. So the yeah, amount of right. with some suggests that the similarity with SYK model was so, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also interested in that. Thank you. Okay. Oh gosh, sorry. I don't know if you heard that. Um, okay. All right. So, so now let me get to the uh, the the more recent work. <laughs> okay. I guess I am going to use the full ninety minutes. Uh, so one ingredient is missing, uh, and that ingredient is fractionalization. Uh, so now we're going to take a we want to take a model that has both SYK physics and fractionization. And I claim once you do that, everything falls into place. All right. Okay, so let me uh, now, you know, just remind those of you who don't know, uh, the model we're going to work with is something called the TJ model. Uh, and it's motivated by the high temperature superconductors. So this is the parent compound of the high temperature superconductors where you have one electron per site, which have this anti-ferromagnetic arrangement. Uh, then you do dope the system, sorry. Uh, and you remove a fraction P of the electrons. Uh, and now you allow these uh, electrons to move around. And there's two basic processes. Uh, they can hop with an amplitude T. So that's the T of the TJ model. So there's another T. Uh, and then they can exchange spin. So there's an amplitude J, they can uh, exchange their spin, so on. And they're fermions moving around with either T or exchanging spin with a J. Uh, and that's it, that's the TJ model in pictures. So of course, we'd love to solve this as stated on the square lattice. Uh, no one can do that. Uh, so we're going to solve some variation of this model. Uh, so here, let me write out the model. Uh, you have some hopping T uh, between nearest neighbors of some lattice and an exchange constant G I J between the spin operators. Uh, and uh, you know, here's everything you need to know mathematically to define the full model. Uh, these are anti-commuting operators. Uh, and of course, what makes it very, very difficult is this, this, uh, pre this constraint here. Uh, that you uh, for prohibit double lock effects. You can never have two electrons per site. Uh, so this is always less than one at every site. Okay, so that's the model. Uh, now as written here, it is impossible to solve, but I'm going now going to solve it in the following limit. We're still going to take a lattice, but we're going to take a large coordination number. So the, some high dimension lattice, Z. And secondly, uh, I'm going to take these JIJ to be random numbers. Actually, many people uh, have looked at models like this in the past. Uh, in particular, there's something called extended dynamical mean field theory, which is closely connected to this, uh, which you get by actually taking even a non-random JIJ. You get somewhat related equations. Uh, um, so, so what I'm going to say may not even require randomness. We don't really know that, but at least this is a model where everything is under control. So let's just stick with that. Um, excuse me, Subir, why don't we have the chemical yes. potential here? I'm sorry, you can, I forgot to put that in, but there's, you can view this as the chemical potential. There's a constraint here. But technically it is supposed to be in the Hamiltonian, right? Well, it commutes with the Hamiltonian, so it doesn't make a difference whether you put it or not. I, I see. Uh, that's just, uh, uh, yeah, of course it's there. If you like it there, yes, sure, uh, put it in there. But I'm looking at some states with finite density. All right, so there's three states on each side, the empty state, the spin up state, and the spin down state that's uh, that I've shown right down here. But I, I don't like this menu keeps popping up with <laughs> the keynote, okay. So this is the model we're going to, we're, going to uh, we're not going to fully solve it, but you need another approximation as you'll see. Even this is a hard problem, uh, but we're pretty confident we're getting close to this, to the solution of this problem. Okay, so the first step is how do you account for this, uh, uh, this non-holonomic constraint that the number of particles on each side is either zero or one. 
Okay, so there's a very well-known way of doing this, uh, the so-called uh, slave particle picture of you fractionalize. So you think of it, you take your electron and you fractionalize it into a, a fermion and a boson. So now you have three states again. You think of the empty state as a boson acting on some vacuum and the up and down as this spin-on acting, the fermionic spin-on acting on the same vacuum. Uh, so now if you impose this constraint, which is a much nicer constraint, there's no inequality, it's an equality, uh, you get the same three states. <coughs> so that's fractionalization. Of course, now you have, uh, since uh, because you have this constraint, you have a, a symmetry or a gauge invariance. So you can rotate the phase of B and F and not change any physical observable. So that's the fractionalization. Uh, now, now we notice that the electron operator, which is an, the annihilation operator, will take you from this state to that state. But to go from here to here, you have to remove the fermion and add a boson. So it's also bilinear, uh, just like the spin operator. And so now what you see is that uh, uh, you can think of both the electron operator and the spin operator as a rotation operator. And it's a rotation in some three-dimensional state. These are the three states here. Uh, and it's a super state because some of those states are fermionic and some are bosonic. So this SU1 slash 2 is sort of analogous to SU3, except that the first direction is bosonic and the next two directions are fermionic. So that's a super group. So there's no super symmetry here, but there's an algebra. These You can think of C and S as uh, algebras in this, uh, operators in this superspace. And another cute thing to notice, which actually is the key to everything, now in this new fractionalized particle formulation, both terms are quartic. So this has four fermion operators because of this. And this one, when you write it in terms of this, has two fermion and two bosons. So it's also quartic. So now if you imagine taking some SYK leg limit, everything is quartic. So that uh, that's great because you know you don't longer have a one particle uh, operator uh, or a two, two two particle operator that's going to destroy everything. Uh, so there's a hope that you can balance the t and the j term at some critical point and, and and get a strange metal state down to zero temperature in such a model. So that's really the simple point. Uh, another point that's useful in understanding the global structure of the phase diagram is that you can make the opposite choice. You can make this empty state a fermion and the occupied states a boson. That won't change the operator algebra. Uh, you still have a U1 gauge theory. The gauge invariant operators, C and the S, will have the same properties. Uh, but, uh, uh, but now instead of being SU1 slash 2, this is SU2 slash 1. Now it turns out SU1 slash 2 and SU2 slash 1 are exactly the same group. No surprise here um, because we understand that from the structure of these, these rotation operators having the same commutation relations as they did before. Sabir, so now in your right. model, in your Hopper space, you introduce bosonic degree of freedom. So uh, does that admit a glass space as a ground uh, state? Yes, I will show you that in a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, I already said that. Okay, so now, so this model is almost ready to be solved. You have to, you can st you can write it down as a finite set of equations which you can solve on a computer uh, in some ways and some limits of that have been solved recently by in a work by Chai et al, uh, which I'll show in a minute, more for the Hubbard model, not the TJ model. Uh, but let me stick with, where we can make analytic progress. And to make analytic progress, you may need to make, take one more limit. You take a large M limit where you uh, let the spin indices go from SUM, SU2 to SUM. In fact, the same limit was taken in the original SY paper uh, for the antiferromagnet, disordered antiferromagnet also. Anyway, so when you take this other limit, everything reduces to uh, very much like the SYK-like equations. You have G in terms of sigma uh, and sigma in terms of G, but you have both bosons and fermions. And, and now you just turn the crank in exactly the same way uh, as you did for the SYK model. And 
I'll summarize what you get. Uh, so particular one of the properties you find is that there's a critical state uh, where both the fermion and the boson have this one quarter exponent. This one quarter correspond to uh, the one of square root of tau of decay that I talked about in the first part of my talk. But from this exponent, if you look at the exponents of the physical electron, that decays as one over tau, and the physical spin also decays as one over tau. And this was obtained in the large M limit, but we also have various RG computations showing that this is actually, these exponents are exact if you found a fixed point uh, of this type. And, but I won't go into that here. Okay. So here's the proposed phase diagram as a function of the density P. Okay. So what you find, there is this critical phase I just described uh, where the spin correlations and the electron Green's function both decay one over tau. So what's on either side? So this is going to be the regime over a weighted finite temperature is going to give me, uh, by the end of this talk, uh, a linear interior resistivity down to zero temperature. So what you have on the right-hand side? Well, on the right-hand side, uh, oh, yeah, this, this, this mouse is really enjoy, uh, uh, annoying. If you give me a minute, I'm going, to, I'm going to try a different way to talk about this. I'm getting this, sorry. This is really annoying me. Yeah, here, let me try this thing. Okay. Um, well, you're seeing my talk. So, yeah, question. Buddy, can I ask you a question here? Uh, so, yeah, please uh, go ahead. I, I guess, I mean, uh, you, you assume a condensate fraction for the bosons in this. Uh, two not yet. No, this is a critical state. The bosons have, have not condensed at this critical phase or point. Okay. I'm going to condense them in one minute, but that's exactly so this, the right question. This would be the mod, this would be applicable at the mod phase, right? Because that, that's the place. No, right this, is the, this, is, this is our proposal for the optimal doping critical point in the cuprates. So this is some optimal doping here at finite density P, and uh, this is much better. Yeah, you have some finite density P, there's some critical PC, and at this finite density, uh, you have these correlations in this model with the random JIJ and the large coordination limit. So, 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 but if I compare this with, for example, cochlear liu type of thing, so there at any finite feeling, the bosons are condensed. Now there is yes. a, there is a fraction, right? So that's how... right. So this is exactly, yeah. Well, that's where this kind of uh, SYK limit comes in. When you, in cochlear and liu, they don't uh, have the full, you know, their equations that they solve for the slave bosons are much simpler than this. Yes. See here, uh, the boson itself can be non-condensed because we allowed for the self-energy here. They don't allow for this term in the self-energy. They just condense the boson. Okay. Okay, great, great questions. All right, so one of the things we find, at least in the certain RG calculation, uh, is that these three states of the uh, the superspin uh, become degenerate at this at this critical point to leading order? So when they degenerate, they're equally occupied. Now, if they're equally occupied, you can immediately see that the density of holes is one third. So that is another remarkable feature. That even without any work, you get the critical dense doping is one third. Okay, that's not too far from the point two that you see in experiments. But now to come to Yashar's question, what about a wave? What happens, for example, on, on the right-hand side and the left-hand side? Well, what you find uh, is that on, if you go to this side with more holes, not surprisingly, the hole becomes lower in energy. And if you go to this side with less holes, the hole becomes higher in energy. So what should one do? So our claim is what you should do here uh, is you want to make the lower energy state a boson. So what you should do is here you use the SU1 slash two picture, you make this person a boson and you condense it uh, exactly like Cortger and Liu. So you condense this boson uh, and then these spin-ons just become electrons 
and there's uh, density of them is one minus p or one plus p after a particle hole transformation. So they have a large density of electrons. You have a large Fermi surface, k a density one plus p. Uh, and you, since you have disordered, it's just a Fermi liquid. So this is the state that, uh, you know, thousands of papers have studied uh, in this kind of slave particle description. Now in this state, the, the fermion correlation function is still Fermi liquid-like, but the spin correlations are different. They decay as one over tau square. That's the decay of any Fermi liquid, which is just the square of this. So that's why this state is uh, quite Fermi liquid-like. This is not, because even though the, this might suggest a Fermi liquid, uh, this shows you it's not. It's actually fractionalized, as you've seen. The way it, it's just an accident that this comes out to be one over tau. And then what should you do on this side? Well, on this side, what you should do is make the low energy state a boson, as I said earlier, because that always helps in terms of getting maximum, lowering your energy. So now here you want to take the other theory, which Schwinger bosons, whereas here you have Schwinger fermions, you take Schwinger bosons and you condense them. And when you condense them, as someone said, you're going to get a spin glass. So this is a metallic spin glass where this correlation function goes to a constant at long time whereas the metal is still one over tau. And here the, the things that are carrying the charge are these holons and their density is P, okay. So these are all, you know, very appealing features phenomenologically, those you know about the cuprates uh, for an optimal doping critical, mean field theory for an optimal doping critical point. Okay, uh, let me just show one slide of a recent experiment. Uh, just NMR one, experiment. Yes. Both hopping and the J were uh, disordered uh, in the in the model, right? I mean, they were um, randomized. So the model uh, that we are using right now, only the J is disordered. The T is in the large T limit. There's two separate models you can take. You can take TIJ and JIJ totally random and all to all, or you can take the large D limit with T non-random and J non-random. A J random, or you can take the EDMFT where nothing is random, uh, but then that's a bit in uncontrolled. There's no, there's no clear cut way of defining it uh, with some control parameter. But nevertheless, you get melon diagrams for both uh, uh, fermions and bosons. Correct. Yeah. So, so the, these equations here. You know, these these are what you'd call the Mellon diagrams, correct? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, equations like <clears throat> what makes them even remotely solvable is because you don't have any momentum floating around, and then you can do uh, analytic uh, analysis. And that's where the large D limit helps. Can I briefly follow up on this question? Uh, sure. So you. You uh, took the model where the mean of the J's was zero. So you have roughly right. many yeah. ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic bonds. If you go to the right. more cuprate like situation where the interaction is more antiferromagnetic, would the picture yeah. still exist? Well, I mean, I can't solve that case. It's harder. Uh, what I would expect is that you know, this phase here, instead of being a spin glass, uh, has some antiferromagnetic moment. Uh, or is a disordered antiferromagnet rather than a spin glass? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would love to do that case, but that's much harder. Uh, turns out the disorder helps, uh, and the spin glass phase is a better under better control. But I, I do, you know, so this is really some kind of mean field theory, which hopefully, at least near the critical point, we hope holds down to some reasonably low temperature. Eventually, we will have to worry about the fact that. This is not really a spin glass, but there's maybe some charge density wave uh, or some spin glass. About this point, you know. Sorry. Can can you can you perturb perturbatively include a, a small mean or something? <clears throat> um, I think you can. It won't change anything. Yeah. You know. Okay. You know, uh, the real system also has disorder, so it's not not so bad. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, severe. I mean, uh, we know that for to get a antiferromagnet, we need to use either symplectic N or use different representation, different size. So, do you do you think that these Schrodinger bosons here give uh, antiferromagnet? 
Sure. This, I mean, this is the, exactly the same Schunger boson theory, except uh, I took a random J rather than a uniform J. It's the same theory. Sure. If you just took the large N limit without taking the large D limit, that's that's the usual Schunger boson theory of uh, Horovus and Arbach, at least in the insulating limit. And then this is some dope version of it. Yeah, but, but, on we, know, the years. we know from uh, uh, such the theory that and what what Arvas and Arvak is doing are doing are putting different representation on different sides on the on the A and B sides type of so oh is, oh yeah you're right so that's right I forgot about that sure 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 so you can take the SPN if you want the identifier okay yeah yeah I mean though that that makes relatively little difference to the structure of the spin glass phase yeah which we are not focusing on anyway. <laughs> Okay, well, I was just mentioning that there is some evidence in the pseudo gap up to the critical point of spin glass order in NMR, but I'll leave that out for the theory talk. Okay, so now finally to the punchline and the recent work. So just to summarize, uh, I just told you about what is SYK criticality, how it's connected to time transition soft mode. And then I've shown you a TJ model of a a certain type that has at least a critical point or maybe a critical phase, which has all the properties of SYK, uh, in addition to fractionalization. Uh, and the fractionalization makes a difference in you know, the fermion exponents, which will be quite important for the last part. Uh, but the time we expect the timing parameterization soft mode to be present, uh, and everything else that we talked about will be present at least at the critical point now in this model down to zero temperature. So that's, you know, of course, got us very excited because finally now there was an SYK critical point. It was stable down to zero temperature, even with hopping. Uh, and that's what fractionalization allows you to do. Okay, so, so now let's go ahead and compute transport. So the first thing you do is just use the Kubo formula. Uh, where you used, I remind, I told you that the Green's function, even at the critical point, has this Fermi liquid form. Uh, and then you find, uh, well, not surprisingly, what you would expect for a disordered Fermi liquid, that the resistance to leading order is just some constant. It has no singular temperature dependence. Okay, so, so that's disappointing. So then you ask, okay, what about, what's the first correction? Now in a Fermi liquid, if this was a disordered Fermi liquid or in either of the two phases in my phase diagram, the first correction would be T squared. Well, what about at this SYK like critical point? Uh, what is the correction? So as I said, one of the reasons we know it's not a Fermi liquid that the spin correlations actually decay as one over tau, whereas it goes one over tau squared in a disordered Fermi liquid. All right, so, so now let's compute the correction to this. All right, so the way you compute this, it's quite an involved computation uh, and something that's discussed in great detail in these two papers for the SYK model by Maldasin at Stanford and Kitev and Sir, and uh, how you go and Yin Fei Gu generalize their uh, this analysis in these two papers to this uh, uh, to this more complicated model with both fermions and bosons. Uh, and what they argued in this mode is that the leading correction to the leading conformal behavior of just about any observable uh, comes from the time parameterization soft mode. And it's a correction that's linear in temperature. Okay, now, so this leading term here, this is just the finite temperature form of the Fermi liquid. Uh, and now we want the correction to it. Now, you know, your first thought would be, what's the big deal? First order in T, everything is linear in T. Uh, no, no, this is actually a much more subtle statement. Since this is a critical state with all kinds of anomalous power laws, a certain operator must have exactly scaling dimension one uh, for this to make sense. Uh, so this, the fact that it's linear in T means there has to be some critical exponent that's pinned to one. And that is precisely the physics of the Schwarzian mode. Uh, it tells you that uh, the structure of the Schwarzian tells you that this critical exponent, these corrections are linear in T. And in fact, this coefficient, which I call alpha G, 
uh, is connected to the coefficient of the Schwarzschild. Now, the connection depends a little bit on the model, and for this particular TJ model, large M limit, uh, that's worked out uh, in this paper here. All right, so, so then the first correction to this is linear in T, and that's really the key point of the whole talk, <laughs> which is uh, an important result of these two first two papers. And then there's some scaling function of temperature times tau, just like this scaling function here. Uh, and this is some other function which can be computed. Uh, depends again on which particular operator you're looking at. Uh, and uh, you can find this function uh, in this paper for this particular TJ model. Okay, so now you have a correction that's linear in T and now you're done pretty much. You just take that correction uh, and you feed it into the Kubo formula uh, and then you get a correction to resistance which is also linear in T with the coefficient alpha G uh, which is then related to the coefficient of the Schwarzschild. So that's the main punchline of the talk. Uh, the same time reprogrammation mode uh, that's present in black holes and SYK models also present here uh, in this state, which you know, which has two things had to work for this to work. First, of all, the, the, the leading term had to be constant, uh, and that's here happens because you're at this fractionalized critical point uh, where the electron operator has a one over tau decay. And secondly, the time the first correction has to come from. Uh, so we expect this to be a very general property of any SYK like critical point uh, in this class of models, even beyond the large N limit. But of course, you can only compute these numbers in, in this uh, large M limit, sorry. Let me ask you a question. So, sure. so here rho zero knows about the disorder, right? Correct, yeah. So then now you have so, obtained a resistance uh, that, the, that the linear T coefficient no, knows about the disorder. You're absolutely right. So this doesn't. So that this particular form of the formula uh, is in the large M limit. Now we would love to solve for SU2, the same model. Uh, we can't. That requires numerics, uh, and we can. So we don't know what will happen for SU2, uh, but it's quite possible, and I have some reasons for that, which are discussed in our paper that in fact this rho zero dependence will disappear in this coefficient. And I'll show you some evidence for that in, in just a minute. But we'd love to understand that better. Yes, uh, good point. Okay, so I still have a few minutes. Uh, yeah, so that's the end of the main part of my talk. What I want to do in the remaining few minutes, if you'll permit me, is actually just review some numerical work on related models uh, that's been done by others, uh, which uh, support the basic picture that I've proposed here. So the numerical work very generally can be thought of on a, uh, not just the TJ model, but on a Hubbard model, you add in a Hubbard coupling. So everything I've discussed so far uh, is that UH goes to infinity. And now I take a model where both TIJ and JIJ are all to all and random. There's no lattice. Uh, and then, uh, you know, people have looked at various limits of this. So one limit you can look at is at zero doping. So let's go to zero doping and take UH to infinity. Then you have the original SY model, just spin, spin dot spin for SU2. Uh, now this was studied numerically by Ar Arkea and Rosenberg, and they found a spin glass. Okay, and this result very much motivated what I've talked about so far. Now, if you dope it, this doping will be described by the TJ model at large U. Uh, this is large U here, and this is doping. This is what I've, the whole talk has been about this model here. Uh, and, and what we discovered, at least claim, is that there's a spin glass phase, then this SYK critical point, and then a disordered Fermi liquid. And that's perfectly compatible then uh, with this uh, spin glass found by Rosenberg et al. a while back at zero doping. And now you can imagine making U smaller. Let's go up here. Then what you expect at zero doping to get a metal insulated transition from a spin glass to uh, a disordered Fermi liquid at zero doping. And this particular critical point has been studied recently 
in this exactly this model. Uh, and there's evidence from the numerics that that has SYK criticality. So that's the work that I just want to show you and end my talk, which kind of motivated a lot of our own work. Uh, this is this work by uh, groups of Antoine George and Luna Kim, uh, Cha et al. Uh, at Flightdown and Cornell, uh, where they actually basically took this model at half filling uh, with TIJ and JIJ random and take the end goes to infinity limit. It reduces a complicated set of equations uh, that experts like uh, Olivia Parkele and company can solve. Uh, it takes a lot of work, but they solve them. Uh, and what did they find? Well, they found at that point, uh, first of all, uh, that spin correlations decay is one over tau. This is the evidence for that. So that's wonderful. Uh, exactly what the SYK criticality would predict. And they found, as shown on this graph here, uh, the resistance uh, going to zero. In fact, the residual resistivity seemed to be extremely small, uh, which is linear in T down to the lowest temperatures that they could do the numerics. A question. Uh, is yes. there an experimental way to probe those critical spin correlations? Would you expect to see them in NMR or, I don't know, neutron scattering? Is there a direct way to probe the spin correlations that they're non thermally fit? Yes. So, so this spin correlation, when you take a Fourier transform, corresponds to chi double prime of omega uh, being a constant. Uh, and, and there is some evidence for that. That's the marginal Fermi liquid like uh, spectrum, if you wish. And that's the spectrum that, uh, uh, you know, some, there are some neutron evidence for that. Even the charge fluctuations, according to Peter Almonte, have that form. Yeah, so this basically corresponds to chi double prime being constant, which is the Verma et al.'s marginal Fermi liquid ansatz. Thank you. So there is some evidence for that. But you know, in the real system, there is Q dependence. So, and, you know, so here we, you know, we're doing some kind of mean field theory, some dynamical mean field theory, which we hope holds down to quite low temperatures anyway. Okay, so that's, I think, the end of my talk. Oh, forget that. So let me just quickly summarize. So I hopefully gave you an idea of what is SYK criticality and all its seemingly anomalous, but quite remarkable properties. Uh, and these are properties of some artificial models, uh, but also of less artificial models. Uh, and the most important is the time interval deparameterization soft mode. And then when you found a, a model with both SYK criticality and fractalization, uh, then very robustly, you know, any such model we claim, which had both of these ingredients will have uh, linear and T resistivity down to zero temperature. So, thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, it was really nice talk and uh, we have to give a clap for the speaker for giving such a nice talk. Now, any, anybody can ask question. If you have more question, you can ask, continue the discussion. Can I ask a first question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Uh, can you please uh, comment a little bit about the role of the gauge field? I mean, uh, in the, on the phase diagram, because it was present and then. <coughs> yeah, so I think when you take the large uh, large coordination or large D limit, uh, the gauge field becomes uh, subdominant. Ah, okay. I mean, uh, it's there in finite dimensions, it will be present. Uh, but uh, yeah, where was it? Um, yeah, I mean, it would be present at finite, yeah, it would be present in any finite dimension, uh, but in the large D limit, it doesn't contribute. So, you know, what I would say in my defense is there's been a huge amount of work on the effects of these gauge bosons on transport. And the net conclusion of that is no one's ever found linear T resistivity. It's always very subdominant. In fact, it doesn't give you very much of transport. Uh, so what needs to be added to gauge fluctuations, I mean, that's another zero mode here, the gauge mode, uh, is the time parameterization mode. And that, that was the missing ingredient, in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, uh, maybe a follow-up question. Uh, uh, regarding the yeah, 
Sorry. Sorry. No. Go ahead. Hey, you please ask because you haven't asked any questions. So you please ask. Hello. Yeah, sorry, moderator. Who asks the question? The girl. And please. You have to unmute. Okay, okay. whoever was asking uh, questions should unmute. So, Yashar, you please continue. Yes, so, so I just have one question. Regarding Una Kim's uh, numerics together with Anton George and Olivia, aren't you surprised that the exponent doesn't get any one over n correction from the SYK large n value? I mean, it is really, really surprising that this, it's the same exponent. As okay, we have to very carefully distinguish uh, one over n and one over m, okay? Yeah. So here we're talking about, I presume you mean one over M because they are doing an SU2 system and we did an SUM system. Yes, right? yes. And, and one over yes. M. Yes, so no, we're not surprised. So this is actually goes back to this result that I mentioned here, uh, which, you know, we'd of course like to understand that better. That's established in the context of a epsilon expansion, which I haven't defined. Yeah, so here. So there's an RG analysis that's in our paper and goes back to an earlier paper I wrote with Voita uh, and Burogahan. Uh, that in fact there are no corrections to these exponents. There's some there's a there's a there's a there's a subtle argument based upon all orders in perturbation theory that you can show that there are no corrections to these exponents. It it follows from so actually in the end, uh, because there's like a West Zemino term in the action, and once you have that West Zemino term, you can make these statements to all orders. Nice. Yeah. Thank it's you. quite subtle, and I, I didn't go through it, but that's certainly a great question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I had a question for you, Sibir. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, th thank you for your talk. I'm from uh, other area of physics. I'm from... Uh, atomic physics and uh, I'm Colin Adams, but I'm also a theoretical physicist. So um, I read your recent paper and uh, can you describe in a nutshell, I mean, really nutshell, uh, how exactly the time reparameterizations of mode maps onto quantum fluctuations of the boundary between the near and far horizon regions? Oh, okay. So you want the gravitational? Yeah, yeah, I really like this. <laughs> well, between quantum uh, theory and cosmology. Sorry, I should use. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so that was uh, worked out by Maldasena and Yang, and I worked it out a little more explicitly for this particular geometry. Um, so what you do is you. So it turns out if you take the low energy limit. Uh, you have, you start out with Einstein Maxwell theory. Uh, then you have, uh, when you go to the low energy limit, uh, you have the metric, which is ADS2. So you have the metric fluctuations, but you also have another scalar field, which if you wish is the radius of the sphere, this R sub H. So in the, you get an effective two dimensional theory, which is JT gravity. And in JT gravity, uh, the scalar field of JT gravity is just the radius of the sphere of the black hole. So that becomes an emergent mode that you have to include. So that scalar comes in automatically. Uh, and then if you, if you choose the gauge properly, the only component of the scalar that matters, uh, you know, you choose your, uh, is the value on the boundary. So in the end, it turns out that you can map everything after uh, after in suitable coordinates to just fluctuate into the boundary. But I really should refer you to the paper of Maldasena and Yang, which explained that in the context of JT gravity, all I did in my paper was to show that the same argument worked for Einstein gravity in four dimensions. Uh, okay. okay. The scalar field of JT gravity came from the radius of the sphere. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other question, guys, please ask. Hello, anybody have any question? I guess they don't, questions. They don't have. Okay. 
so all right yeah so we will finish right now and uh, we are very happy to have you and uh, gave us time and give a very nice talk it's very clear and it is already recorded i will share the link with you very soon once it is posted in youtube so have a nice time and be healthy and safe so another time we have to clap for subi thank you very much yeah that was fun thanks for all the good questions <laughs> i i don't have a question i have more of a bit of a historical reminiscence Yeah, go ahead please say. um i i remember once i was uh, at at penn state when um, uh, subir gave a talk i think on the pyrochlor lattice and uh, emergent ads geometry in the center of gravitational physics and i uh, so abhay abhay ashkar was also there and i i remember very clearly to this day like after the talk there was quite a you know robust back and forth between the two about uh, <laughs> whether this anti dissiter space is just a mathematical tool or whether it's uh, something that's more than that more than just a mathematical analogy that's just something in my memory yeah well i mean those days the early days of but now uh, hopefully i can convince you that uh, we can forget about gravity just think about the time we parameterization soft mode that's all we need for kinetics matter in the end <laughs> but yeah okay <laughs> uh so i i was joking but yeah it's quite a you know quite like i said earlier i mean it's it's quite remarkable how convoluted the story is i mean this time we parameterization soft mode could easily have been discovered 50 years ago when people study black holes but it wasn't and only now after you come this this long circuit as root uh from syk models that people are now understanding its role just in 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 quantum gravity yeah okay thank you very much so all right <laughs> yeah so bye see you all okay thanks a lot santan Yeah